Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Jill Thomas, and as chair of the worship, chair of the worship committee, it is my honor to serve as your worship leader this morning. We are pleased that you have all joined us, either in person or online, and know that you are welcome here. We welcome everyone, all ethnicities and races, all sexual orientations and identities, all social, economic and, uh, all social and economic situations, and all abilities. And we have one service a year where we even welcome our four-legged four and feathered friends. We have several accommodations to enhance your experience if you need them. There's a scent-free area, large print hymnals, hearing devices. For our littlest friends, we have busy bags. And I need to check, we had a crawling rug back there. Is it still there? Okay. I was afraid it might have been taken out in the flood you'll hear about. <laughs> After the service, please join us for coffee, tea, and treats in the fellowship hall. And uh, I know that uh, a lot of people have told me that they have suffered from fellowship hall freeze where they go back to the door and go, but really, we want to get to know you, so please join us in the fellowship hall. Uh, they, everyone has said that after they'd gone in for a while, they felt like they were at home. We even have a newcomer's table that's just feet inside the door, so you can sit at that table, and I can assure you, you will be welcome. Please consider giving a gift of time and energy to the church. We are in need of some volunteers. Coffee hour is always needing volunteers to help set up and help tear down after the service. We need donations of snacks for coffee hour. Not only would you be providing a service to the church, it's a wonderful way to get to know people. Another opportunity to form connections is a new program called Mugs and Musings. Starting, September, or starting February 1st, our membership coordinator, Regina Stanley, invites you to join her on Thursday mornings at a local coffee shop. We can speak about whatever is on your mind, whether it's spirituality, current events, personal stories, or any subject you find interesting or important. Each month will be a different coffee shop, and for the month of February, meetings will be at 10 a.m. on Thursdays at Intuition Coffee. Next week, Heather Vickery from the UU Service Committee will be coming to speak to us. The trans and gender experience, expansive persons in our faith are, being under, are under attack. Uh, many states are criminalizing their lifestyle and their choices. Our faith calls us to make holy trouble for the powers that would deny anyone full humanity. After the service next week, there will be a potluck followed by a discussion about the actions our congregation and members can take in supporting something called the Trans Relocation Network. The purpose of the network is to help people move from places that are not safe for them into areas where they are safe. And I'm proud to say that Illinois and Peoria are considered safe places for these people. Please join us next week and learn more about what actions you can take to help this uh, network. Now, I'd like the board president to come forward for a moment and give us a little update on the great UU flood of 2024. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Linda Fairbanks. Uh, about 10 days ago, uh, most of you know, we had a pipe burst in the back of the room here. And we had a wonderful contingent of volunteers who uh, caught it early, cleaned it up, dried it out. We we're all very happy that that happened. Um, but if any of you have experienced water in your home, you know that's not the end of it. So as of today, we have some developments. The, we have found some moisture behind the walls and in the organ area that is a threat to create mold. So there's going to be some additional work. Um, so we have a meeting tomorrow, 9 o'clock here, with the, in the parties who are going to help with this. But I want to prepare you. There are going to be some construction. We're going to need to take some of the wood off the wall and get behind it into the drywall, 
and dry it out. Um, we will have to disassemble some parts of our beloved organ, and that will be done with care and love and make sure that we can reassemble it properly. So I just wanted to let you all know that it looks pretty good, thank goodness. It was, was not as bad as it could have been, but we are not through this yet. So um, Bob Swanson, Gene Burke, and I know David and Sherry Weisner, uh, and many others are involved in consulting with the cleanup, and we'll make sure it's done properly and as quickly as we can. Uh, if you have questions, you can come see me. Again, my name is Linda Fairbanks, um, and uh, you know, whoever or whatever your higher power is, let's uh, put a little love up that way that uh, it isn't as bad as it could have been. So, thank you. Today is an intergenerational service, and there'll be no formal religious education but there will be childcare available, so if any time your, your child needs to get their wiggles out, feel free to take advantage of that. It'll be back in the RE wing. Our church is unique in that we are a creedless church. Our members and friends are not asked to subscribe to any specific belief or a belief in specific deities or, or a single deity. Rather, we seek to live out our mission, embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing spiritually, and healing our world. There are seven UU principles, the last one of which is respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. In living this principle, we recognize the wide network of relationships around us. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They came down from, I Deleted a line. <laughs> they were here long before any of the Europeans came down the river and long before the first settlers uh, settled the land. We honor the Peoria people for who they are and for who, the, for who they were. Today's service will focus on that interdependent web, the connection of the world around us. Our guest speaker is Brian Ellis, better known to many as Fox. He will be telling us stories to celebrate our connections to all life. More about Fox later. Now would be a good time to, enter, to put your phone into worship mode. We have a slide to help you find where that's at. So as we enter into our worship together, please rise in body or spirit as you are able and join in the singing of our opening, opening hymn, Come Sing a Song with Me.
like to ask Holly Green to come forward and give us our opening words for this morning. Weavers of One Story by Leah Ongiri. <clears throat> Here we are, together, each facing our different human tasks, or maybe the same central one, to embrace the lessons life delivers, to discern and respond as we grow, to refuse harm and cherish flourishing, May we know ourselves as vessels of infinite possibility, holders of each other's heartaches and tales of joy alike, weavers of one story in which we each have our part. Our chalice lighting today will be read to us by Regina Stanley and the adorable Miss Riley. We are the Unitarian Universalists. This is the Church of the Open Minds. This is the Church of the Helping Hands. This is the Church of the Loving Hearts. Together, we care for our earth and work for peace in our world. A single candle in a dark room casts very little light, but a multitude of candles can chase the dark from the corners. Our hearts bear many joys and concerns. While Kathy plays music for meditation, a single candle will be lit on each table, and then you can come up and light a candle of your own. You can light a candle for a joy, for a sorrow, for a hope, a remembrance, a concern, whatever is in your mind and heart. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> When our ritual is complete, the tables will shine brightly. Just as many candles light a room, our many candles shining brightly show of our shared concern and love for one another and our hope to light your path.
lit a candle for a neighbor of mine that recently passed. The poor old soul suffered from dementia. He would wander our neighborhood shouting and scaring children, and I guiltily admit I would avoid him. Unfortunately, he refused all help. I know nothing more about his circumstances, but his passing is weighing on my heart. Are there, theirs, are there those that will mourn him? Today, I lit my candle for Phil and for all of those who, due to mental illness or isolation, are not blessed with the connections that we all so desperately need. As always, there are joys and sorrows that are on our heart but remain unspoken. Please join me for a moment of silent meditation. Today, it is my great joy to introduce our guest speaker, Brian Ellis, or as he's usually known as Fox. Fox is an internationally known storyteller. He brings history to life as he portrays a number of historical figures, including Walt Whitman, James Audubon, and Charles Darwin. He's authored many books and has recorded a number of CDs. From his bed and breakfast in Bishop Hill, he offers writer's workshops and hosts author book fairs. A favorite childhood memory for my family and, are the, and friends are the times we've listened to spooky stories or Native American star stories while sitting around a big bonfire behind the Twin Flower Inn. I now invite Fox to the lectern to share with us a story for all ages. Were any of you there when the world began? The truth is, the calcium in your bones and the iron in your blood have been here since the dawn of time. And so for you younger people here, next time a parent or grandparent says you're not old enough, you can tell them, but I'm four and a half billion years old. And it's true. Simon Ortiz, a Pueblo storyteller, mentor, elder, uh, and friend, once said, the stories we tell about the beginning say more about us than how the world was made. Do we tell stories that are inclusive, that are hopeful, that are filled with love and that sense of connection? In the beginning, when the world was new, Gichi Manitou, the maker of us all, made the sun, the moon, the stars. In the beginning, when the world was new, Gichi Manitou, the maker of us all, made the earth, the mountains and the rivers and the sea, the forest and the prairies, the deserts. In the beginning, when the world was new, Gichi Manitou made all the creatures here upon the earth. In that beginning time, Gichi Manitou gathered all the creatures upon the earth because all creatures spoke the same language. And Gichi Manitou, the maker of us all, said, I need your help. Tomorrow morning, I am going to make the most awesome being. Tomorrow morning, I am going to create the first man and the first woman. But I need your help. Before I create these creatures, I want to hide a small bit of myself somewhere so that when they are in need, when they are hurt or, or angry or sad or feeling alone, they can find me. And I will be there for them. But I need your help. I don't know where to hide myself. Native people believe, as I hope you believe, that we all have a good mind when we use it. And when we put our minds together, we come up with the best ideas. 
So everyone was listened to. Everyone was given that respect. The first to come forward was Tatonka, the buffalo, bison. And Tatonka said, get your money too. Make her of us all. Give me that small bit of yourself and I will hide it in a cleft between two hills in the tall grass prairie and they will never find you there. Gichimanatu said, oh, I, I wish that would work, but you will see there'll be a day when the people come to the prairie and they are hungry and they shall turn the prairie grasses upside down to grow the food, to feed the people. They will level the hills. They will destroy the prairie. And besides, I want to hide myself in a place where they can find me when they need me. Oh. The Tonka stepped back into the circle. The next to come forward mm, was Grizzly Bear. And Grizzly Bear said, give that small bit of yourself to me and I will take it into the heart of the mountain, the deepest, darkest cave, and they will never find you there. Oh, but you will see. A day will come when the people in their greed, in their hunger for power, they shall destroy the mountain, turn the mountains inside out, looking for shiny things they don't really need. And besides, I want to hide in a place where those who are hurt, those who are in need, can find me when they need me. Oh, and Grizzly Bear stepped back into the circle. Many animals stepped forward with many ideas. Eagle flew down, and Eagle said, Ah, I am one of the highest flying birds. Give me that small bit of yourself and I will take you to the moon and they will never find you there. Oh, but a day will come when the people will build a ship that will sail to the moon and it shall be called the eagle. Time out. This story is a thousand years old. How do they know about the Apollo 11 mission? But the day will come when they will find their way, when they're seeking knowledge outside themselves, they will go to the moon and how do I make myself more clear? I want to hide that bit of myself where I can be found, where those who are hurt or sad or lonely can find me. Many animals suggested many things. As the day went on, it seemed as though they were running out of ideas. Until, from the edge of the circle, they heard a quiet voice, as soft as the wind in the pine trees. And they knew it was the voice of Grandma Mole. Could you all imagine a little mole? And she crawls forward, and they knew to respect their elders. They listened, because her voice was so soft. She said, uh, Gitchi Manatu, the maker of us all, it seems that those who seek power, those who are greedy, they seek outward. But those who are lonely and those who are hurt, those who seek wisdom, they shall turn inward. Why don't you take that small bit and put it in the heart of every boy and every girl, every man and every woman? Hide it in them. And when they need you, you will be near. When the other animals heard such wisdom, they knew it to be true. And so it was. The next morning, when Gichi Manitou, maker of us all, went down to the river and gathered up the clay mud, you and I, simple piles of mud, and formed the first man and first woman before Gichi Manitou, before Gichi Manitou gave them the sacred breath of life, Gichimanatu put a small bit of themselves in the heart of each man and woman, in your heart, in my heart. We're still to this day 
If you are sad alone, you are never alone. If you are hurt or confused, if you seek wisdom or love or quiet joy, turn inward. And our maker is there. Closer, closer than my heart. Nearer, nearer than my mind. Right within every breath I find you. Everyone breathe. And I become the blue of the sky. I become the thunder. I become the earth seen star. To honor you, wonder of wonders. We honor you, wonder of wonders. Just as a single candle cannot light a room, a single donation does not keep the lights on in the sanctuary. Uh, when we contribute to the church, whether it is time, energy, or money, we are saying this church is important to me. This church is an important part of the community. It is an act of commitment and dedication, and at times it can be an act of courage to support our progressive religious tradition. We live out our values with the offertory plate by practicing something called share the plate. One third of the undesignated funds in the collection plate will go to a local agency that supports our UU values. The other two thirds goes to the church operating fund. This month our charitable recipient is Lulu NFP. This is a Peoria outreach program that provides food, temporary shelter, clothing, sleeping bags, blankets, bus passes, and other items that are crucial for survival for the people that are living on the streets or in tent encampments. Their clients have all experienced great trauma in their lives, and most suffer from some form of mental illness. They also provide assistance in navigating all the available resources, such as housing and medical care. It receives no government funding and relies solely on private donations. Please use an envelope from the pew pockets to indicate if your donation should go entirely to share the plate or to the operating fund or simply contribute by cash or check. For those that are more tech savvy, there's even a QR code in the order of service that you can use to make your donation. And online, there's a link on our website. Will the ushers please come forward?
please rise as you are willing and able and join us in singing for the beauty of the earth. Kathy will play it through once and then we'll all join in singing. And now I would like to invite Fox back to the lectern to share with us stories to celebrate our connections to all life. Fox? Thank you. Hush and listen to the earth, to the song she is singing, singing rock and rain and rill from each mountain and valley, calling, calling, from her heart she is calling. What are the songs and stories of the earth? What are the songs and stories that live in us and through us, around us? Take a deep breath, please. As Walt Whitman said, every time I breathe in, I breathe the outside world into myself. Take another deep breath. What you just breathed in was inside the trees and the forests that surround this beautiful temple. How many of you have been for a walk on the loop out back? Take another deep breath. This cold front that just came through, you're breathing Canadian boreal forest. Say thank you, Canadian boreal forest. I was only partially correct when I said the calcium in your bones and the iron in your blood is as old as the earth, and it's true. You are four and a half billion years old at last estimate. But the truth is also that we were there when the universe was created. So kids, the truth is, you're at last estimate about 13 to 16 billion years old. Think about a molecule. Think about an atom. Think about protons and electrons whirling around the neutrons and protons. 
take the space out between the protons and electrons and neutrons. And you could take everything in this room and you could squeeze it down smaller than a marble. Of course, that marble would weigh as much as this room. Take out the space between the pews and the people. The space between the walls and the trees and the buildings of greater Peoria. Take the space out between the proton, electron, and neutron. And you could take this entire planet and you could squeeze it down into something smaller than a softball. It weigh as much as this planet. But this, take the space out between the stars and galaxies. Take the space out between all the planets, known and unknown, the black holes and wormholes. Take the space out between the proton, electron, and neutron. And you can take the entire cosmos and you could squeeze how small, I don't know. But they say the world began with light. <laughs> An explosion so big that right now we have a satellite dish in Puerto Rico that is the size of a football field. And this satellite dish built into the side of a mountain is listening shh, to the sound of deep space. And what it hears is the echo of that great explosion billions of years ago and the ever-expanding universe. And yes, it is a cliche, but it's still true. We are stardust. We are golden. We are part of that huge expanding universe. But as that explosion happened, some things began to coalesce. In that beginning time, molecule or atoms were fused together to create heavier atoms. And in that beginning time, atoms fused together to create molecules. And molecules fused together to create planets and suns and our sun and the light that we breathe and eat and imbibe. The earth was made, as I already said, about four and a half billion years ago. And then a huge meteor struck the Earth and bounced off, and because of the gravitational pull, became our moon. Some planets have multiple moons. We only got one. But in that beginning time, there was a really good friend of mine who was there and told me this story. He is a molecule of ferrous oxide. You might know him as Rusty. Rusty was there when the world was made. Rusty was a little fleck of iron and oxygen. You put them together, it turns red. Rusty was there as the crust of the earth cooled. And could you indulge me for a moment? Put your hands together. Rub your hands together. Harder, faster, faster, harder, faster. You feel that heat, feel that friction. Put on your cheeks on a cold day, feels good. Now instead of rubbing two hands together, imagine rubbing two rocks together. One the size of North America, one the size of Africa, Europe, and South America. Actually, my indigenous elders, we call this Turtle Island because we know. Hold on. North America's swimming in the ocean. Hold on. It even looks like a turtle with Florida and Baja California and Mexico. It's swimming in the ocean sky, swirl void. And when the continents crash together, if you want to take your two hands, two continents crash together, one goes underneath. Can you say subduction? And if you push that other one against it and as it slides, you feel how it catches and releases? That's what causes earthquakes. Did you feel that a couple weeks ago? We had one in the Midwest. And when one goes under, what is that called? Another one is pushed up. And that's how mountains are made. The Appalachian Mountains were actually pushed up, worn down, and pushed up again. How do I know? Because Rusty was here. He told me this story. And actually, one of those earlier plate tectonic shifts, there were volcanoes in Michigan. And molten magma rose up. And because of the heat of the friction, 
molten magma, rock was melted and rose up and was cast in all directions. And if you go to the Kenai Peninsula in Michigan, you find iron and copper and other rich minerals. How do I know? Because Rusty was there. He told me this story. I'm, I, and I'm going to, you know, I just covered, uh, what, 16 billion years in those few sentences? <laughs> Let's speed up a little bit. If you were right here, uh, 300 million years, so we just cut some zeros off. If you were right here 300 million, not billion years ago, this was a shallow sea. Hold your breath. If you were right here 300 million years ago, we'd been underwater. And there are seashells in the bedrock. Depending on what period, Ordovician, and Devonian limestone. Right here. But as those continents swam apart and the earth warmed and cooled and that volcano erupted, uh, let's, let's drop a few more zeros. They don't add up to much. Imagine you're right here 100,000, so not 300 million, but 100,000 years ago, it got really cold. You think last week was cold? It was so cold that the winter lasted for 100,000 years. And every winter, more snow fell than melted. In the summer, it didn't all melt, so more snow fell on top of that. And more snow on top of that. And created walls of ice in some places a mile thick. You ever wonder why the Midwest is so flat? These glaciers, like bulldozers, cut the tops off of mountains and filled in the valleys. How do I know? Rusty was here. He told me this story. He was actually part of that molten magma, became a chunk of granite made about 800 million years ago and was carried here by the glaciers uh, 100,000 years ago. And when the glaciers melted back, they left chunks of glacial erratics, rocks. They were made in Canada. Yes, rocks migrate. When the ice melted back, Rusty was left here. But as the ice melted back, big hairy elephants and woolly mammoth and mastodon, <laughs> saber-toothed cat and sloth bear were right here. I used to work for the Cincinnati Museum of Natural History, and I've held the tooth, not a fossil, but an actual tooth of a saber tooth that was found here in the Midwest. A friend of mine working in the gravel pits in Chillicothe, digging up that ancient Ordovician and, Gen and Denovian, uh, the, the, uh, Devonian limestone, ancient seashells, found the tusk of a woolly mammoth 16 feet long, right north of here. And you always, kids, wonder what that mystery meat is in your school lunchroom? <laughs> Leftover woolly mammoth. <laughs> Again, when I worked at the Field Museum, they found one frozen in an iceberg in Siberia, and they could tell what it had eaten for dinner. It was that well preserved. And one of the scientists said, I wonder what it tastes like. And they barbecued woolly mammoth at the Field Museum. I missed that dinner. <laughs> How do I know all this? Rusty was here. He told me this story. But as the ice melted back, um, the big hairy animals moved north. And as it got too hot, get out of the kitchen. Some of them went extinct. Some of them just kept going north, like the muskox. It still lives up there. But as the ice melted back, forest from the south migrated north. Yes, if I went out back, as I did right before the service, and, and I visit those oak trees, I did not take a genetic sample, but if I did, I bet hard cash money, the genetic of, of your 200-year-old oak trees out back, those trees migrated here from Missouri in the Ozarks. What? Oak trees migrate? Yes. An oak tree grows and drops an acorn. It sprouts and drops an acorn. It sprouts and drops an acorn. And over a thousand years, the oak trees of the Ozarks migrated here. How do I know? One of those oak trees sent a root down into the ground. One of those oak trees found that chunk of glacial erratic made in Canada 800 million years ago, carried here by the glaciers 100,000 years ago, and that root grew down into that crack in that rock. And as that root grew, it cracked the rock in two and <laughs> drank Rusty up. And Rusty went up through the xylem and phloem cells into the, uh, through, under the cork cambium, out into the branch of the tree, into a twig in a tree, into a leaf in a tree, and... Uh, and became part of that leaf. 
And for the first time in 16 billion years, Rusty had a job. As part of the iron in the leaf, he was part of photosynthesis. Can you say photosynthesis? The factory in the leaf that makes food to feed us all. Any herbivores here? Vegetarians? Anybody besides me like to eat acorns? They have a lot of high tannic acid, unless they're white oak, and then you can, you can actually leach out the tannic acid, and they're a lot like a, a walnut. They're tasty if you cook them right. Um, and, but Rusty worked in that leaf making food to grow acorns. And he actually cycled around through the tree a couple of times, and when um, it, it got cold again, no, not another ice age, when it got cold again, it was just winter this time, um, the, the, the tree actually pulls a lot of the important minerals out repurpose, reuse, recycle, reduce. These aren't just buzzwords. It's how all life lives. And so he was pulled out of that leaf and stored in the trunk, and the leaf fell to the ground. And that leaf, ah, I just noticed on my shoe <laughs> from walking in the woods this morning, uh, decayed and became part of the soil again. And the following spring, when the earth thawed and the snow melted, and right now's the time to make maple syrup, if you love maple syrup like I do. And, and the, the Rusty went up through the trunk and back out. And this time, though, instead of going into a leaf, he went into a little flower. Now, on oak trees, the male flower and the female flower are separate. Most flowers have male and female parts together. That's pretty common in nature. But in, uh, in this flower, the oak flower, the catkin, is separate from the female. Now, how do trees get together? They can't, like, go to the dance on a Saturday night. They're wind-pollinated. And in just a couple of weeks, you'll go out in the morning, and your car will be dusted yellow. Billions of grains of pollen from the oak and the pine that are wind-pollinated. Most pollen is wasted on the ground, but not rusty. He got lucky. And you know what happens when the male part finds the female part? Love. <laughs> or when, the, when different parts come together out of that choice of love, who are we to say what is love? But they're in love. And little acorns are made. And the leaf, factory of the leaf, feeds the acorn all summer. And all summer, the acorn grows a little bigger and a little bigger until late in the summer, early fall. It's a big, fat acorn. And along comes a squirrel. And the squirrel climbs up in that tree. And the squirrel eats that little acorn. And Rusty becomes a squirrel. He loves climbing trees, leaping from limb to limb, running way out on the furthest branch, gathering acorns and putting them in his cheek and burying them underground. And does the squirrel remember where he buries all those acorns? How does he find them in, this, in the winter? Little post-it notes in his den? Sense of smell. No nuts over here. They can smell through like six inches of snow and leaf litter and dirt up to a foot down. No nuts over here. All the nuts are over here. <laughs> and, uh, and he finds an acorn. And as he's digging it up, he's not the only one who's, hung who's hungry. Sitting in one of those oak trees. And no, Joe, that wasn't me calling outside your window last night. <laughs> At the bed and breakfast, we heard owls all night. Because this is the time when owls are looking one for another. <laughs> and when the owl saw that squirrel, mm, jumped from that branch, wings longer than my arms for a great horned owl, soft feathers that slice the air, so the squirrel didn't hear him coming. As a squirrel, is he snatched from out of nowhere, the owl hits, and they hit the ground together, and he tears at the throat and blood, and, uh, and the owl has breakfast. And Rusty becomes an owl and learns to fly, learns to soar. But that winter, it was really cold. They actually had a cold spell that lasted like 10 days below zero and pipes froze at the church. And because of the deep snow, it was hard to find food. It happens to all of us. It's a part of the cycle of life. 
Rusty the owl grew old. I hope you all have a good long life with many years ahead of you. But ears didn't work so well. Hunting not so efficient. Without food, without fuel, without that light from photosynthesis of the sun through that web of life. Rusty the owl froze and fell to the ground. Buried in the last of the oak leaves, the last tree to leave, lose leaves. Buried in snow, frozen. But when the snow melted, the leaves melted, the owl melted, and along came a fly in the spring. You and I might smell that and go, ew, gross. But a little fly goes, mmm, supper. And no, Rusty did not become a fly. The fly thought, there's so much food here, I can't let it go to waste, and laid eggs. And the eggs hatched. And Rusty did not become a maggot, like a little grain of rice that wiggles. The grain of rice that was the maggot ate Rusty, but like most of the food that we eat, just passing through. And Rusty became mud, like you and I. Lucky piles of mud who can stand up and breathe, who can sing, who can love, who can strive to know our place in this great web we call life. Hush and listen to the earth, to the song we are singing, singing rock and rain and rill from each mountain and valley, calling, calling from her heart. She is calling. If I could step to the dais for a moment and just say, I believe the first sin that we as humans created, it's all in our head. When we think we are separate, when we delude ourselves with this nightmare illusion that we are separate, all other sins come from that. How could you ever be mean or unkind to some person who breathes the same breath that you breathe, who shares the same molecules and atoms, how can we even begin to contemplate the sins against the earth and the environment if we just pause and think that glass of water is going to flow through me and out into the world? That piece of plastic that we discard will find its way into the ocean and into seafood that will be served at your favorite restaurant a year from now. Every sin against our fellow creatures stems from this one illusion that we are separate, that we are alone. Please, take a deep breath with me. And every breath you breathe in, know you are connected. Take another deep breath. What you just breathed in was inside the person sitting next to you a couple seconds ago. When we pollute it, we have to breathe it too. <laughs> Take another deep breath. Say thank you, Canadian Boreal Forest. Think about the calcium in your bones. An actual fact, it was a Devonian seashell. 
because Illinois American water gets two-thirds of its water from wells that are pumped through those ancient layers of limestone. The calcium in your bones was a living sea creature 300 million years ago. The iron in your blood has been here since before time, before we had any sense of time. You are 16 billion years old. Every day you shed a few hairs, some of us more than others. Every moment you're shedding, sloughing off skin. And what was you will become some other life form. Even the simple act of trimming your fingernails, as I did while I was driving in this morning, toss them in the garden. And what was once you becomes the black-eyed Susan in the front yard of the church. We are so connected. Every simple act, every fork you put in your mouth, every glass of water, every hug, Kids and elders, one of my coolest recent facts, if I could collect some of the microbes who live on your eyebrow, you have these tiny arachnids that are related to spiders. They're microscopic. If I could collect a few of those and do a DNA analysis, I could tell where your great-great-great-grandmother was born. Because who's the first person who kissed you and gave you those arachnids on your eyebrows? It was probably your mother. And who's the first person who kissed your mother and her mother and her mother back to the dawn of time? A friend of mine did the genetics. Looking at those arachnids who live in your sheets and your pillowcases who eat the dead skin sloughing off of you. We can tell if you're Slovenian or African, if you're Japanese or Jamaican. We are connected in so many ways. Take another deep breath. Do you feel it? Do you acknowledge it? Do you know it in your soul? With every breath, I find you. Closer, closer than my heart. Nearer, nearer than my mind. Right within every breath I find you. One more time. And I become the blue of the skies. I become the thunder. I become the earth seen stars. To honor you, wonder of wonders. I honor you, wonder of wonders. Please join me while we sing our closing hymn, Blue Boat Home.
welcome Pat to the podium to give us our closing words. Before I begin, I just want to say, wasn't this just a marvelous, marvelous service? Okay. This will make me cry as I was reading this before. We Are One by Amy Zuckerman Morgenstern. Never has it been more true than now. We extinguish this flame, but the sparks remain within us, remain a light from each of us in our supposed solitude. The signals buzz and hum, sparkling through space, through one another, connecting us indivisibly and palpably. We are one. From every window, our light shines. I leave you with words from Susan Carlson, blessed by our connections. We leave blessed by our connections to one another, to the spirit of life. Walk lightly that you can see the life that is below your feet. Spread your arms as though you had wings and could dance through the air. Feel the joy of the breath in your lungs and the fire in your heart. Live to love and be a blessing to this earth. Our worship has ended. Let our service begin 